Let's turn in the Scriptures to Luke chapter 16, and I want to read from verse 19. Hear the word of God. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abram's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abram, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abram said, Child, Remember that you, in your lifetime, received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abram said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Our Lord Jesus tells this story of two men, a rich man who rejected God and a beggar whose trust was in the Lord. Both of them died, the beggar went to heaven, while the rich man went to hell. One of the reasons he told this story was that we may know something of what lies after death. Many will enjoy the pleasures of heaven, but others suffer the horrors of hell. That is the conscious experience of all who die. We all live in a room out of which there are only two exits. On the one door, heaven is written. On the other door, hell. No other doors. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance after death. There is no soul sleep. There is no limbo. There is no such thing as the annihilation of the soul. But there is, after death, the evaluation. And then there is heaven or hell. The Son of God is emphasizing here that souls do not die as bodies do, but after death the souls of men and women live on and are consciously, intelligently aware of the love of God or his wrath immediately. This rich man who was suffering the torments of hell holds a conversation with Abraham. 
It is with this patriarch in particular because Abram is the father of all who believe. God once spoke to Abraham and made great promises to him. He pointed to this man, the stars, and said that he would so bless Abraham that his progeny would become numerous, like the lights of heaven, like the sands on the seashore. In a new heavens and a new earth, the momentum of the good news of the Messiah of Abram's line would bring this multitude there. He would give Abraham a child in his old age, and through this child all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Because one day in the line of Abraham, a child would be born, and he would be the savior of the world. Abram responded by believing all that God said. He left his house in Ur, and he set out with his family to this unknown place which God said he was preparing for him. And in such an obedience of faith, an obedience of trust, Abram became a real model for all who similarly hear the word of God, believe, and are justified. All men have sinned and deserve the judgment of God forever, but the Lord has provided redemption through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Through him, believers in all the nations of the earth are blessed with the gospel of salvation when they entrust themselves to the Son of God. And all of these believers then come into the blessings of glory after they die. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I'd have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. And one day he will welcome us. In Christ he will say, come ye blessed of my Father, and take your inheritance. And this beggar then whom Jesus spoke of, was one of those whose trust was in the coming Messiah. The same Savior who spoke of heaven also spoke in unambiguous language, warning the world of the awful truth of a place of woe, of the worm that doesn't die, the flames that are not quenched. He spoke of wailing and gnashing of teeth. Out of darkness, everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The Lord Jesus taught that hell is real. It is ruled by God. It involves rejection and pain. He said more about it than anyone else in the Bible. And if we are serious in our understanding of the man who preached the Sermon on the Mount, who, when he addressed the waves and the winds, they obeyed him, who healed every elderly incurable in the last stages of their diseases, then um, this Jesus, who on the third day rose from the dead, then we must take whatever he says with the utmost gravity. We must reckon with the fact that this man of integrity and patience and love said plainly that some people would spend eternity in hell. Although he said that this present life was important, it was not all important. The name Lazarus means God helps, and this poor beggar signifies that he received saving help from God. The parable has this great theme of being too late. The rich man pays attention to Lazarus too late. He sees the unbridgeable chasm between heaven and hell too late. He worries about his brothers too late. He heeds the law and the prophets too late. So let's see the first conversation in verse 24. Now, the first conversation of the man in hell concerns a request that he might be relieved of his torment, which was unbearable. But Abram told him that that was impossible, telling him, in effect, all your life you've received of the, the goodness of God, the common grace of God, great blessings. You've lived and moved and you've had your being in God and every lovely thing that you've enjoyed and all the prosperity that you've enjoyed have been God's gifts 
to you. You've been told of the mercy and the long-suffering of the grace of God when you went to the synagogue and the word of God was read to you. You discovered that the God of Moses and the prophets was a God of tender mercy and the preachers were watchmen who were warning and heeding you and telling you you must come and you must turn to him find peace through the coming of the messiah but after death it's too late mercy is unattainable death fixes the destinies of men and women forever and in hell you're experiencing only the fair correct justice of god and you will do so forever only god knows what sin deserves some might think that this is unfair but god alone is the adequate judgment of our wretched lives. The rich man's condition then can't change. There's no hope. There's a great gulf fixed between them and those who are in the presence of Abraham because those who are there did entrust themselves, their lives and every detail, all the providence brought into their lives. They, they looked to God. They found comfort and consolation, and they found contentment in submitting to the good and perfect will of God for them. There's no possibility of a change after death from one estate to another. There is no d desire to love Jesus Christ. Abram tells the rich man that awful fact. The second conversation in verse 27 is a request of the man concerning the fact that he has siblings, he has five brothers, and they're still in the world. So the man in hell devised a scheme by which they wouldn't join him there because that would make hell five times worse for him. So he devised a plan of evangelism, and many human beings do. He imagines a way of delivering his siblings from the place of woe. The five brothers always knew of the beggar whose pitch it was just outside the gate of the drive up to this rich man's house and all the parties and birthdays they celebrated with their wives and their, and their children. They passed this man who would put out a hand and would seek arms from them. He was always there. And so they knew also he, he, one day he wasn't there and they inquired, where's that guy? Oh, he, he's died, they were told. So the rich man says to Abraham, send that man Lazarus from your side back to my brothers to show himself to them as one raised from the dead. And the result of that, they will be overawed and they will believe, especially when he tells them about hell and warns them about it. If a man should be raised from the dead and tell them what's happening to me, the rich man, then they will change. They will no longer curl their lip and say, nobody's ever come back. But they'll believe in God and they'll escape hell. And that is the wisdom of a man in hell. That's his proposal. And from that request arises a discussion between Abraham and the man in hell. And Abraham argues one side, and the man in hell argues the other side. And Abraham is defending the position of those who believe in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The man in hell represents um, the position of those who demean the Bible, who mock the Bible, for whom hell is just uh, another swear word. Men of the Enlightenment, men who say, I did it my way. Men who never trusted in a savior. And the argument goes on still today, undercover, out it bursts at times. And it's important for us to see what this argument consists of and the difference between the two approaches, the approach of uh, Abraham and historic Christianity and the approach then 
of the skeptic. One thing is true of Abraham and all who believe like Abraham, and that is they are satisfied with the Bible. Theologically, we would say that they hold to the sufficiency of Scripture to save any person from hell. In verse 29, Abram says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. There's Genesis, which tells us that God is a personal God, an almighty God. He is we. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He made the world. It tells us why the world is in the state it's in, that man bit it off and spat it out and did it their way and defied God and took of the forbidden fruit. And that time of probation ended in rebellion. And then it speaks also of the great one who will come to deliver, the seed of the woman who will come and, and he will bruise, he will crush the serpent's head, though he will be bruised in that whole process. And then the book of Exodus, we are told, of the Passover, when death came upon the firstborn of Egypt, but on all those who heard the word of God and did what the word of God said, sacrificed the lamb and sprinkled the blood on the lentil and on the doorpost, then there was a Passover of judgment. And that next morning, their firstborn was alive and, and, and well. The lamb had shed its blood, the innocent for the guilty. And then the book of Leviticus, it tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And if you ask why, well, that is the nature of God. And the book of Numbers tells us of the brazen serpent that was lifted up and the people weren't told to walk on their knees up to it and walk around it seven times and kiss it. They were told to look and live, see it there glinting, the brazen serpent on the pole there, look, just look and you will live. And the book of Deuteronomy tells us of God entering into covenant I will be their God. They will be my people. I will bless them. I will keep them. I will protect them. I will provide for them. Jehovah greater, I shall pledge myself to be their Lord and their God forever and ever. They have Moses, Abram says. And the rich man's brothers had all the rest of the Old Testament written by the prophets. Um, Thus saith the Lord, they said. They were conscious of the derived nature of the message that they brought to the people, that uh, it wasn't original. They didn't originate any of it, but they were simply echoing what God had taught to them. And so Abram said, let them listen to Moses and to Samuel and Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Jonah and the rest of them. Listen to them. How much more should we listen who uh, have the writings of the eyewitnesses of the majesty of Christ, who saw Lazarus come from the tomb at the command of God, who sat and listened to the Sermon on the Mount who heard the great discourse in the upper room, followed by the greatest prayer that's ever been prayed, who met Jesus, risen from the dead, who saw him for six weeks almost, and ate with him and drank with him. Ghosts don't do that. And were recommissioned and were promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to be his plenipotentiaries, to be his authoritative spokesman and who would write of the life of Jesus in four Gospels and 20 letters explaining him. Shouldn't you listen? Shouldn't you pay heed to those? Shouldn't you make that then? You are resolute determination to seek 
and know what the Word of God has to say. The Scriptures are enough to bring men to faith in Christ. They can save a man from hell. And then Abram adds in words to this effect in verse 31, if they don't listen to the Bible, nothing else whatsoever will convince them. Nothing else at all will do any good, not even the specter of a resurrection before their eyes. So the question that I am confronting you with and that I am confronted by this word is, do I agree with Abraham? On the one side of the debate, verse 27, is the man in hell, and it says, he says to us, it seems a great idea for the doors to open and uh, um, that, that man, your, your father, your old preacher, that he walks down the aisle. He's been raised from the dead. And he's warning. But Abram says, they have something far better. They have the Scriptures. No, the rich man says, no, the Bible is, is not enough. He has no confidence in the Word of God. He is saying they need something more than the Bible. I know, I know my brothers. They won't be saved by the, by the Bible, he says. It's an ineffective book. You can't get, expect people to get serious about eternal life and flee from the wrath that comes simply by hearing a man preaching the Bible or by reading a, a gospel of Luke that someone has given to them or now, it's very interesting to note that the man in hell addresses Abraham respectfully, and he calls him Father Abraham. And the patriarch acknowledges and responds to him with the word son. In other words, this man was a fellow Jew, a member of the Old Testament covenant people. He'd been circumcised and ethically and outwardly. He's a son of Abraham. And the Lord Jesus here in Luke 16 is speaking to fellow countrymen. He's addressing people he knew from his many years in Nazareth and his visits to Jerusalem three times a year to the feast. He knows them. He, things weren't done in, in a little corner secretly. They weren't done in a cave in the Himalayas or an island in the South Seas. They were done openly in the Roman Empire with Pilate in charge and Herod there and uh, people who knew him and knew something of his biography and his, his mother. And now he is confronting the Pharisees. They've been in existence about 200 years. They're uh, the moralistic, uh, self-appointed public guardians of decency in their rules and regulations and the Pharisees who were covetous heard all these things. Verse 14, they heard it, they heard it, and they derided him. They couldn't imagine that they were in any danger of hell. And even when they saw Lazarus raised from the dead, they continued their plotting to kill the Lord Jesus. This rich man then grew up in the synagogue and consciously pervaded by the atmosphere of the books of God. He heard it, heard it week by week, never obeyed it, never loved it, said it was boring, never dreamed for a moment that he would end up in hell. He did things his way, never thought that one day there would be a great chasm and it would be fixed between himself and Abraham. And there are many like him who hear the word of God preached with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven. Judas heard it, Ananias heard it, Saph Sapphira heard it, Demas heard it, the Judaizers heard it, all were lost. So you see, here is the man from hell saying, if the scriptures are the only thing that you're going to give my brothers, well, I had the scriptures. I had them. What good did they do me? They didn't change me. In fact, he is saying, in hell, deep within his heart, is perfectly understandable. Why, I didn't believe. 
and why they don't believe, because all we had was the Bible. I know my brothers. I know how they live. I know where they're going. The Bible is not going to touch men like that. They need something more. In effect, he is saying they're victims. And their unbelief is excusable. Ah, if only I'd seen a miracle. If only that had happened. That thrilled me. I would have believed if a man I knew was raised from the dead and spoke to me, well, I'd have pricked up my ears. I'd have listened very seriously to what he had to say to me. And I would have gone to a meeting if I knew amazing things were going to happen in proclamation on a Saturday. Then, oh boy, my car would be there early in the morning to make sure I had a place to listen. But all I had was the Bible. The Bible. And that's what many people say. <laughs> that the climax of our worship after we sung to God and prayed to God and exhorted one another, then God speaks to us in his word. That's all? Is that all you have? They say. You don't expect the people to be uh, attracted by the Bible, by preaching the scriptures, by texts outside uh, the chapel and verses on, uh, on bus station walls and tracks with scriptures on them and memorizing scripture and lessons on the Bible to children in Sunday school and camps where young people are taught the scriptures and conferences where the climax is always opening the book and finding the place and declaring the word of God you don't expect people to be attracted by that, do you? We need concerts, we need drama, we need costumes, we need bands, we need choreography. Bring in the drums and the synthesizers, send for the clowns. Then the people will come. We need superstars and celebrities, Hollywood men, who will come and they will say, yes, I, I'm it's the best thing I ever did when I trusted in Jesus. Not just the Bible alone. But you see, Abraham was unyielding. People say, we need grottos. We need ivory-clad boxes with relics, pieces of muscle and bones and pieces of hair from people of yesteryear. We need pieces of wood from the cross and a staircase which... Uh, Jesus walked on once, and you walk on that. that that's what that we need. Not just the Bible. And the more error there is in their doctrines, then the more signs, and the more substances, and the more revelations that they need. Up and up they go, and down and down go the word of God. God. The Roman Catholic Church says the Bible is not enough. You've got to have sacred tradition and manifestations of Mary in little country places to teenagers. And the Quakers say the Bible is not enough. You must have the inner voice in the congregation. Modernists say scripture itself is not enough. You need the assured results of modern criticism. They say you must go back to the sources behind our present gospel narratives, and you will find then the authentic, diluted substance. Cults say the Bible is not enough. Men must obey a book, the Book of Mormon, or Science and Health with a Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy or the Watchtower's productions of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Many charismatics say the Bible is not enough. It needs to be authenticated by miracles and signs, and all such people are saying that the Bible is not good enough. They say it's a good start, but it needs a bit of help from us. And the implications are, are just devastating 
for the numbers of people then who have gone along with extra scriptural statements and revelations. The further from the truth you go, the more the scriptures are ignored, the more signs, the more miracles, the Bible goes down. So people are taught that this is power evangelism. Unless we do miracles, there will be no converts. No, Father Abram, says the man in hell, not the Bible alone, the Bible plus. The, bus, the Bible plus informal entertainment, the Bible plus background music, the Bible plus women then preaching. You, you think of the plus and you go around and you talk about the plus that changed your life and changed your congregation and made you a, a mega star. And you give lectures about it and write books about it and you get a movement. How I found the plus that makes up for the rather inadequate Old Testament and New Testament. And you hold conferences and tell the world how you found the way to compensate for the failure of the scriptures. Just like this man in hell, he had no love for God. He thought of a way to make up for the inadequacies of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so on. Now remember, Abram was in heaven before Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Abram had a unique perspective of the development of redemptive history. Um, and he was in the presence of God when the Lord spoke at the burning bush to Moses and then to the prophets who said, oh, thus saith the Lord, I've had this word from the Lord, and then they wrote it down. He was listening to God, and he, he felt the power of that word, the power that moved heaven and moved the men who heard that word. Go to Moses, he says. Go to Samuel and David and Solomon, and Elijah and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and help them, help the people to understand the message of these men. Proclaim it, and then publish it, and give it out. It's inspired, and if you ask Jesus to what degree it's inspired, Jesus will say, to the jots and the tittles. Abram heard God speak, guarding, controlling, guiding. No, not that when John on Patmos was about to write something, the messenger of God said, no, don't write that. God takes care of what is here. Abram knew how perfect, how infallible, how accurate, how true, how glorious was the word of God. From the lips of God, this, this word has come. And Abram knew and loved them. They were spirit, they were life. They were powerful words, the same God who said, let there be light, and then the, the darkness it was dissolved immediately. A friend of mine is remarried like me, and he says, oh, my wife now, she, she can't stand up any gap in the curtains at night. She wants total darkness or she can't sleep. So I get up in the morning and I feel my way across the bedroom and I open the curtains. And what do I do then? Do I see all the darkness rush out and fill the world with its darkness? No, I see the light pouring in and overcoming the darkness. And so it is with the light of the Word of God when that was rediscovered at the Reformation. And when that light began to shine, then all the darkness of medieval superstitions was driven back. And in God's light, we were enlightened ourselves. We have the word of God. In Sunday times, in divers manners, he spoke in times past to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, 
His Son has come. His Son is the brightness of God's glory in the express image of His person. And when He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, and He ordains everything. He ordained that I should come here from London and that you should come from different parts of uh, America and Hungary and should be here today and to be assured again that the great work of God, the great revival that he gave in the 16th century when the solars of the Reformation brought light to a medieval church in darkness, that these truths are as relevant today and as powerful today as when God spoke and there was light. The Lord Jesus has said, no one knows the Father save the Son, and he alone has that infinite acquaintance with his Father. There is the immensity of the Almighty, and only the Son knows him comprehensively. And at the end of, the life, uh, end of his life, he is thanking God, and uh, he is praying, and he thanks him for the the strength that he had been given in those three greatest years in the history of mankind when he preached all through Galilee and in, in Jerusalem and in the upper room and his pulpit was sometimes a ship and sometimes it was a mountain and sometimes it was a table with other people there and he, he brought the word, he brought the word of God to them. And at the end of his life, he is thanking God for the commission and the provision, and that he's omitted nothing, nothing at all that is essential for us. The Scriptures can make us thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a wonderful thing to be thoroughly equipped. You have a new bathroom put in, and it's wonderful, but the water has been switched on. You have a new kitchen and all the white machinery there and the marble tops, and, but there's no electricity. It's not thoroughly equipped. But whatever lies before you, whatever challenges, whatever losses and crosses, whatever opposition and discomfort, whatever bouts of ill health, you're thoroughly equipped by the Word of God thoroughly equipped. And you who are called to be preachers of the Word of God, you're equipped. None of us preachers will stand before God and will say, why didn't you equip us? Didn't I give you, didn't I give you the Word of God? Yes. Didn't my Holy Spirit, come and indwell you? Wasn't Jesus there in your heart? Didn't you have illimitable access to an indwelling Spirit? Yes. How can you say you were not equipped for the calling that I gave to you? He will say, everything has been provided for. And Paul, you know, the last of the apostles, that's what he says. And then last of all to me also. In other words, he was the last apostle. No more apostles are needed. The apostles are the foundation. Every church in the world today and for the past 2,000 years, every congregation is built on this foundation. You know, when they put that building up that you passed every day on your way to work and the, you saw the cement trucks coming and the great tubes and the ironwork, the grid had been laid and then they poured out the cement on it and then they let it harden for a week. And when you went a week later, you didn't see another cement truck coming and uh, another foundation laid and another week and then the third week and the fourth week and so on. One foundation is enough. And the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's there. And all of us, by the message 
of that book have come to faith in Christ. None of us saw a man raised from the dead. Nobody in the world saw a man raised from the dead, and they became Christians because of this. We have Moses. We have prophets. We have gospels. We have epistles. We have them in our own language. When John Jewell, one of the great English reformers, the Bishop of Salisbury, was preaching on the Scriptures, he then addresses the congregation. He says, are you a father? Have you children? Read the Scriptures. Are you a president? Are you a governor? Are you a judge? Read the Scriptures. Are you a minister? Read the Scriptures. Had God blessed you with wealth? Read the Scriptures. Uh, uh, are you a user? Read the Scriptures. Are you a fornicator? Read the Scriptures. Are you in trouble? Read the Scriptures. Are you a sinner? Have you offended God? Then read the Scriptures. Do you despair of the mercy of God? Read the Scriptures. Are you going out of this life? Read the Scriptures. And we would say, and sit under scriptural ministry. Find the best proclaimers of the word you can and heed what they have to say to you. It's not a luxury. You, you, your soul needs it. Abram was saying, do you want to see? Do you want your brothers to see a miracle? Your brothers have got a miracle. They have it when the scroll is opened and the scriptures are read every Sabbath day. And they can purchase a copy like an Ethiopian eunuch bought a, a scroll with the word of God and read it and devoured it. And we may have it too. We who live 20 centuries later have the Gospels and the Acts and the letters and the book of Revelation, the, the new covenant writings, the miracle that leads the church and touches and changes all your lives today. When I take this book, when I hold it in my hands, <laughs> I'm holding a mighty work of God. I'm, I'm holding a miracle in my hand. Here is something miraculous in its independence of thought, in the comprehensiveness of its themes, of its utter and invincible confidence that it's the most relevant word I can ever hear to my life and to my family and to my friendships and to my congregations. And sometimes in moments of doubt in our minds, we must rest in this, I have the Bible. I have this great intrusion from another world, a, a word in which men may hear the unique utterances of the Son of God. I've read much of human literature at its best. Oh, I devoured books. I lived a hundred yards from the Carnegie Library when I was in junior school. And oh, I went there twice a week and borrowed the two books I was allowed and took them back and read and read and read. And then had the problem when I was 11 and 12. How do you break into adult reading? And I found books of Hornblower and Sherlock Holmes and then developed and discovered then the great Russian writers and studied Shakespeare, went to Stratford Avon and saw performances of Shakespeare there. Fascination with words. But here's a book that knows me. Here's a book that describes me. Here's a book that understands my frailties and my weaknesses. Here is a book whose concepts are of unsurpassable grandeur, words that are invincible in their sheer originality. Every Sunday when we meet, we meet around a miracle. Every single service, there is this miracle. Not just those red-letter days when the preacher's got a word and, you know, it's just he's got the structure and he's got the alliterations and he's got the illustrations and he's moved and he's moving you. Those are great days. Oh yes, we don't demean such days. God give us more of those. But other days, the days when it's a challenge, when the passage of scripture you're looking at is not all that clear and he's doing his best. It's the word. 
and he's applying it, and he's taking it seriously, and he's making you take it seriously. And the Holy Spirit comes, and those are the strange meetings when people say, it was that Sunday that I came to know the Lord. When you limped along and you didn't want to go to the door and shake hands with people afterwards because you wanted to apologize. But she came to know the Lord that Sunday. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. You say you, if you only saw a miracle, you would believe. I tell you, here is a miracle. What Bishop Jewell said, read it. Read it. Listen to it being proclaimed. Faith comes through the message, and the message is through the word of Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, that's God's message. You say, well, you know, our church, wonderful things has happened in your church. Well, I, I, I believe you. A woman was told she had just months to live, and we prayed for her. She had cancer. She made a full recovery. Well, praise God for that. When did that happen? Oh, it happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Do you know yesterday's miracle is a day late for today? We have a, we have a miracle. We have it. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Shakespeare never said anything as wonderful as that. Only the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. So our sending out men and our providing for them and our praying for them, that they take the gospel into Asia and South America and Europe and Africa. That's the God-ordained way. You bless God. I bless God that a man came to my church and preached the word, not very clearly, and he wobbled a bit, but he had enough to say, Jesus Christ is a great savior, and you must trust in him. And God touched my heart that 59 years ago, just the word, that was it, just the word. And that's the testimony of scores of you in the same way. You came, just ordinary conversions by the word, applied by the spirit in a congregation of people you respected and loved. It was the scriptures that have made us wise unto salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I have many people that I've given to my son, and uh, they're his bride, and he's going to find them, and he's going to save them. They they're like the sands on the seashore. They are, by nature, dead in their sins, hostile to God at enmity against him. They're rebels. They provoke me dreadfully, but I'll forgive them. I'll change them. I'll regenerate them. I'll work by the Spirit through the Word of God. That will be it. And I'll send him to them to seek them and find them, and save them. I will work through 
a lovely mother who's never missed a day without praying for you, a father who seeks to be an honorable, normal man through people who come and say, have you ever thought of the claims of Jesus Christ? God bless their words. He wouldn't let them fall to the ground. And we're here today because of the word, because of the word. You don't need to be a scholar to understand the scriptures. There are some parts that even Peter found were hard to understand. But where they are hard in some parts, they are simpler to understand and grasp. The way of salvation through faith in Christ is very clear. From Genesis 3, 15, right through to the invitations at the end of Revelation 21, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, come. This morning you come. Coming is when the Holy Spirit applies his word that you've heard preached to your hearts. And you know you can't go on any longer keeping him at arm's length. He, you must have your arms around him. You must kiss the son. You don't want his anger. You want his eternal friendship. Where will the scriptures take you? They'll take you for full maturity. Whatever duties and challenges. You know, you young people, you've got to choose. You've got to choose a partner, a husband, a wife for life. What a great choice. And then children will come and you've got to provide for them and care for them. And there are choices you make with work and salary and If you don't have my Savior, what do you have? If you don't have my word, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't listen to the Bible, what, what, who have you got? What have you got? Every mountain God asks us to climb, every burden God asks us to bear, every service God asks us to give every pressure he asks us to endure, every sacrifice that we make. Scriptures, help us, assist us, keep us comprehensively, prepare us for every good work that will be required of us. The Scriptures will complete this work. He put away childish things. Put them away. It can't help you. When you were a child, it was Lego was great, and Lego is still great, I suppose. But when you're a man, when you're mature, you need to know the Gospel of Romans. You need to know this personality of Jesus Christ to be refreshed by him. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by talking of a wise man. And he builds his house on a rock. And the storms and the winds come. And Jesus is looking forward through the centuries. Uh, and he knew all the storms that would be hurled at American teenagers. by All the media and the educational system and the humanism that seems to be triumphing everywhere. But every, every man and woman, every boy and girl, this little boy and the gates of hell want to destroy him. But while he stands on the word of God, he's safe. The storms may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and can I be dismayed? The professing church today is in a hopeless demoralized state when they say the Bible is insufficient for the task before us. One man was being talked to, uh, being witnessed to in a very kind and patient way 
and uh, he was frustrated because there was an answer to all his objections. And in the end, he looked at this Christian and he said to him, let's close the book and listen to the Spirit. And that's the great danger. That's the enormous danger. When people say they want to listen to the Spirit, they're listening to their hormones. Scriptures tell us wisely what we're to think and what we're to do. And we add nothing to them. We're not to call sin anything that God doesn't call sin. You know, uh, when students in my years at, uh, in this university town in Wales, when students came to, to faith from non-Christian homes and then they were baptized, and their parents would come, come from Scotland, or come from England, come up from London to our little coastal town there, and they'd be at the service, and they'd listen to the testimony of their children, and they were touched by it. And then we had cups of coffee and tea downstairs afterwards, and they would talk to me, and say, oh, we're so glad, you know, we're so glad that, uh, that they've become religious just as long as they don't become extreme. And I sympathize with that. I don't want my three daughters to be extreme. I want them to be sweet girls who work at school and pass their exams, and if they're able, go to college and get a job and find a good holy man who love them and care for them and raise children themselves and be good neighbors and visit friends and I hate extremism. Extremism is bombers, suicide bombers. Oh, my friends, you come, you come to the God of the Bible. He, you know, do you know, he's here with us today, and he's brought me to give you this word, and he's brought you here. And the purpose is that you may more closely walk with him and love his word and serve him for the rest of your days. You've got a foundation on which you can build your life. And we're going to sing about that in a moment. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. <clears throat> Thank you for Scripture. Thank you for men who <clears throat> preach the Bible and establish this <clears throat> conference where the great truths of the Bible should be taught and preached and loved and obeyed. And oh, we long for a day of an awakening when, when people will in their thousands long to hear the Word of God opened up and Jesus of the Bible magnified so that they put their trust in Him and receive forgiveness of sin and deliverance from hell. Oh Lord, do, do bless us. Do bless us and help us. Help every preacher here. Help every elder and deacon here. Help those young men who are thinking about should their lives be lives of serving the living God. Oh, be with them, Lord, and guide them. Raise a generation again in our land. Don't let the salt lose its savor. Or our light be put under a bushel. But, oh, help us to shine for Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and all the 50 states, Lord. Revive your work in these days. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this special presentation of the 2023 Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology. Here we stand. Presented by the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. For the complete schedule as well as access to conference resources, visit AllianceLive.org. That's AllianceLive.org.